Welcome to the 108th episode of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. So damn paranormal. My name is Jason Knight, host of the show, and with me, as always, is... Oscar Specta. Producer extraordinaire and podcast co-host. Yeah. Well, listeners, I'm sure you can tell this is a Skype episode. Please excuse any audio imperfections. But uh, Mr. Oscar Specter, how you doing over there? Are you staying warm? Uh, you know, it is chillier, but I'm really warm. Yes, I'm doing <laughs> good right now. We're snuggly. Snuggly. Good, yeah. good. Uh, we're recording on Skype because, wouldn't you know it, the only day we could meet uh, Chicago got rocked by a snowstorm, yes. got about eight inches of snow. Mm -hmm. uh, the temperature plummeted quickly. It's like eight degrees last time I checked. Uh, so it was just really dangerous to get out. Uh, neither one of us really wanted to drive. So the show must go on. Listeners expect a podcast release every second Monday. Uh, so we had to get together on Skype, right? Yeah, we have to. Well, you know, the show must go on, right, as they say. Um, that's right furthermore like it rained after it snowed and it was I like, know it was super weird it made everything worse so I'm like come on I know like, and it, way to freeze everything yeah and I'll tell you shoveling uh, shoveling out my driveway and everything like that it was that heavy wet heart attack snow man I thought I was gonna die it sucked <laughs> yeah it, it was horrible like it. it was so bad and then you gotta love once you're done shoveling out your driveway, the goddamn snow plows come by and shovel it right back in. Yeah. And only this time it's heavier. Yeah. <laughs> it just sucked. Yeah. So so we had to Skype. That's the whole point. Yeah, yeah we had to. Our relationship didn't uh didn't didn't break down to, to weather talk. It's just that's the, the cause of Skype. Right, that's the reason where we sound slightly off or whatever. However we sound like, that's different. That's why. That's correct. Uh, essentially. Um, yes. Yeah, but we, we, we make it well. This is not our first uh, rodeo. We've done this before. We have. It's a, it's a little awkward not being able to see each other's uh, nonverbal cues. Yes. Like if you want to say something or ask a question, you know, I could pause just based on hand gesture or facial motion or whatever. Yes. Uh, now right. we can't. So. Yeah, um, you're right. But I'll tell you, I'm trying something a little different. Well, I tried this with uh, the last episode we did with Minister Sal. Uh, I'm literally recording this under a blanket. Yes. Um, I have the, the blanket propped on my laptop, thrown over my head and shoulders, uh, elbows holding down the corner of the blanket. And it's hot under here, Oscar. I'm sweating well, I, already. I believe it. I believe it. You know, it's uh, – I. I your pursuit, or what did I text you? Your pursuit for sound perfection is unparalleled. Yes. <laughs> it's, I'm sick. I have problems. No, it's man, never, it's never good enough. It's never healthy people that makes perfection. You know, that's always unhealthy, fucked up people that like find, <laughs> you know, invent crazy things or like do something awesome. So it's okay. All right. Good. Well, with that out of the way, uh, what's been, what's been new since the last release? Oh, um, let's see. What the hell was the last release? Oh, that's right, part two of the Mayan thing. Yeah, twenty twelve um, part two. That's right. Yeah, no, it's been it's been kind of chill. It's been quiet now that the season's over. You know, since I work in retail, like it's been a little quieter now. Everything's simmered down. Um, you know, just it's been me and Lexi's just you know slogging through every day, just hanging out and stuff. Nothing major or anything really happened. Um, a lot of people are getting sick around me, but. But uh, I'm fine now. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. So, good. so not uh, no news is good news, I guess, right? I, yeah, I guess say. in this case, <laughs> you know, yeah, I guess in this case. Uh, Lexi and I visited a, a sex shop today. That was uh, the one funny thing, I guess. That oh, a sex shop. Yeah, we did. Were you looking for something in particular? Oh, yeah, we were looking for something in particular. We came out with more than one particular thing. Could you tell us one thing you walked out with? Well, I can tell you the thing that we went in for that we did get. Um, oh, yeah. The So we needed new nipple clamps because we ran the, the ones we had broke. So, yeah. Damn. So we need you wore clamps. out you wore out the nipple clamps. Yeah. We, we just like she can't work without them. So I needed to get some. 
I mean, if if that's one of the her tools of the trade, it's necessary. Right. If it's right. If it, if it progresses things in a better way, why deny it? Right. I I just think it's awesome that you guys actually wore out nipple clamps. I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. Well, it's a uh, lot because you know it's a. Uh, I don't know if you play with them before, but a lot of twisting and turning to adjust to the strength, right? So yeah. I guess a lot of that, just like, we just couldn't get it to, like, work the same way. Some parts were stifled, and I was trying to see if I could clean it, and it's just so many problems. I'm like, it was just like, and it broke, finally. Guys, just twisting it too much. Whatever. It's gone. But yeah. Man, you, you guys are animals. I love it. Yeah, we're not. We're not <laughs> healthy. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, we're good. Uh, yeah, and then we've got other stuff that is actually way more scarier than that, but I will not mention that here. Whoa. And, and it seems Lexi's over there with you. She yeah. gave us our so damn paranormal. She's giving me the looks right now. Like, what the fuck are you telling Jay slash the rest <laughs> of the world? <laughs> but she's fine. She's like giving me like a, oh, you know, why you little kind of look, but not like a real like she's mad or anything. Uh, one of those playful, angry looks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cool. That's right. Well, make sure and tell Lexi that myself and the rest of the world said hello. Okay. <laughs> they, the, the world says hello, honey. She's back to her game now. <laughs> oh, right. She doesn't care. She don't care no more. <laughs> well, man, this might be a short intro because, you know, kind of over here is the same thing. I mean, no sex shop visits, but... <laughs> It's been pretty chill, pretty pretty boring, actually. Just a lot of work. Like you said, the holidays are over. So it's kind of this after-holiday lull over here at the night household. Um, kids are back in school. Work is back in full swing. So uh, nothing too interesting. Been traveling a lot uh, for work. The new position going uh, going yeah. okay. Yeah. Is that, Did they finally pay you yet? <laughs> uh, well... <laughs> I'm kidding. Yes, I'm kidding. no. They, it, well, it's funny you mention that because they screwed up. They screwed up my first round of pay, uh, and that was great because it was right after Christmas and during our Florida trip is when that first big payday was supposed to come in, and it was fucked up. So yeah. uh, after a few weeks, they finally figured it all out. So my next pay should be that much more uh, right. plus, you know. Gotcha. So it's but a paycheck it was, uh, plus. Yeah. A paycheck plus, exactly. But it was yeah. uh I was a little scared at first. I'm like, well if this is this is how it's gonna go. I don't think I wanna be be here in this position, right. but we got it all figured out, so Well that's good. Oh here's a here's a strange problem I've been having with my vape. You know Your vape? Uh oh. Yeah. I think something's wrong with my mod or maybe I'm charging the batteries wrong. I did get different new batteries, you know, because the other ones were like peeling, you know, so I figured I should replace them. Yeah. And because I use rechargeable batteries. And I have maybe I'm in trouble with it. It keeps like shutting off on me. It keeps saying that it's a different coil than it is. So the indicator, I'm like, why are you doing this to me? It's the same coil that it's always been. Hmm. And yeah, I don't know. It's just been, that's been driving me nuts lately. You know, and that's something. Um, I just get a whole new mod. Maybe like it's just old. It's been a year or two. So, you know, you know, at the end of the day, these are first world problems. You know that, right? I do know that, but you said that we <laughs> you, we both don't have much to say in the intro. So I, I know. Just we're, found now we're stretching. One. We're stretching. Yes, <laughs> that's funny. And we started with weather talk too. So, oh God, we did. God, this is yeah. degenerating are, quickly. Are you drinking anything under the blanket? Uh, as I was setting up, uh, trying to get my internet working properly. Uh, to ensure there's no interruptions with Skype, I like to hardwire, and it was being a real pain in the balls. So while that was, while I was troubleshooting that nonsense, I had a nice glass of uh, Basil Hayden's whiskey on the rocks. Oh yeah, nice. And it was it was delicious, and I think that's what's causing me to be under extreme heat right now. Yeah, it's compounding that, that'll, the heat. That'll warm you up. That'll that's that's for the winter. That's for winter. Exactly. Like. That's a yeah. That's a, that's a, if you're like in a log cabin in the middle of nowhere, you drink that, yeah. you feel nice and toasty. Exactly. I'm drinking, I'm drinking peanut butter mead. Oh, you are. Yes. Oh, you lucky son of a gun! I don't I, have any. I, I drink like one or two shot glasses a day, and um, and a mojito that Lexi made. So. Lexi made a mojito. Yeah. I love mojitos. Yeah, I'm not. I wasn't a big fan. I mean, I was a normal fan. I was a casual fan of it um, before, but now I'm like, yeah, cyber make it for me like every other day. So it's great. 
Nice. Yeah. I, I think the best mojito I ever had, uh, Katie and I drove uh, one time straight through from Chicago to St. Augustine, Florida. Wow. St. Augustine, you know, the oldest city in the country, very haunted, very historic. Uh, yeah. And we, we just pulled into town. We were dead tired. Um, it just, you know, at each other's throats, kind of just a super long, painful drive. And we pulled into this little restaurant and I'm like, damn it, I need a drink. So I saw on the menu that they had a mojito and I, uh -huh. I, I, I like mojitos, but right. the, the server went out, uh, outside the restaurant into a little garden that they were maintaining themselves. Oh, they made with, it fresh, fresh with herbs and stuff. Yeah. And they picked fresh mint and, nice. uh, they brought it back and they mold it real nice into the glass. And I, I don't know. I think the, the freshness of that mint plus the, the long drive, it just, that's, that's my most memorable, probably one of my most memorable drinks actually. Uh, so yeah, it's all, it's all in the details. That's great. I mean, it, this one isn't, it really is. You know, we don't have the sprig of all that, or we don't have the crushed, what is it, the crushed sugar that you put with the mint at the bottom. We don't do it. She didn't do yeah. any of that. We have we have like a mix, and we have um, yeah, uh, we have uh, Bacardi, and we have um, you know the the club soda, you know. So it was like a simpler mix, but yeah. Oh, still, still, still good, still good. Still, I like it the mojito for sure. Well, very good. Should we roll into the contact information? Uh, I don't think know us by now, though. I don't know. What if it's a brand new listener that never heard us before? I don't know who you're talking about. There's no new listeners anymore. There are, we got them all. I think we got kind them. Kind of. <laughs> oh, God. Wait, I have to get my phone because we do have a new iTunes listen, uh, iTunes review that I have to read in a little bit. Uh, I just knocked down all my blankets. Damn it. All right, we're back. <laughs> Okay. So, Oscar, in case you didn't know, the easiest way to contact the Supernatural Current Studies podcast is by it's visiting our website. Code? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Is sorry. by visiting our website, chicagoghostpodcast.com, and clicking Ooh. on follow. From there, listeners could get to our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and of course, Patreon. And speaking of Patreon, if you love the Supernatural Current Studies podcast and you want to hear episodes no one else gets to hear in the regular feed, I suggest you run over to patreon.com forward slash Supernatural Current Studies podcast or click the Patreon icon on our website or click the Patreon link in the show notes and pledge your support for the show for just $5 a month. That's just 17 cents a day. You'll get immediate access to ad-free podcast episodes and exclusive Patreon-only podcast episodes. And yeah. there's a bunch of them up on Patreon right now. You'll also receive a Supernatural Occurrence Studies podcast sticker and a detailed mention at the top of a show and in an episode show notes with links to your social accounts, your business, your vlog, whatever – and if you support us at the $15 a month level, and that's just 50 cents a day, you'll receive all the above benefits plus an awesome, huge Supernatural Occurrence Studies podcast lapel pin. And I just got new pins made, and they're all glittery and cool. And you'll also receive signed photographs of actual real-life ghosts. How cool is that? So visit our Patreon and pledge your support now. That's patreon.com forward slash Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast, or go to chicagoghostpodcast.com, click on follow, then click the Patreon icon, and it'll take you right to us. Oscar. Ma'am. Did you know listeners can leave us voice messages or send us texts, and we'll read them and play them on the show? Uh, All they have must to get, is, is that the scammers that I keep getting? <laughs> no, this is, is legit. That... Oh, okay. Yeah, all listeners have to do is call Chicago area code 872-529-0767. That's 872-529-0767. Our email is contact at chicagoghostpodcast.com. 
Send us an email about your thoughts on the show. Tell us your own paranormal or freaky stories, and we'll likely read them on the show. And who doesn't like to hear their selves, their stories broadcast across the world? I know I do. Our Instagram and Twitter is at Chicago Ghosts, at Chicago Ghosts. YouTube is Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. And guys, we got a ton of stuff up on YouTube, so check us out there. If you go and visit our YouTube, make sure and, and like the page and ring the bell so you're notified every time we upload new content. And finally, the easiest way to, the, to support the show is by leaving us a five-star ratings on iTunes. iTunes ratings help listeners just like you find our show, our little passion project. So please help us out and leave us some love on iTunes. You could do it right off the cell phone you're listening to this podcast on right now. And speaking of iTunes, we received an awesome iTunes review a few days ago. So let me go to my phone here and pull it up. Yeah, that's a good one. So <laughs> this is a five-star rating uh, called The Drinks Are Flowing, and it's from TAPS. That's T A P S S S S S S S S S. I think you missed one S. I I might have it taps. There you go. Did I get it? Okay. Yeah, I think you got it. So taps says, "quote Just started listening about a month ago or so ago. Saw it in my suggestions in my iTunes podcast app. Absolutely love this show. They touch on all things paranormal and are very knowledgeable about all of it." You guys get me through my boring work days in and around Charlotte, North Carolina. The dynamic of these wonderful people reminds me of my friends and I when we were younger. We would hang out and discuss, discuss deep topics like this for hours. You guys are hilarious. Also, you always make me laugh right before you freak me the hell out. I listened <laughs> to a few other similar podcasts, and I love the conspiracy topics involving the world government working with the paranormal for sick, twisted power. Anyways, you guys are awesome. Hope the show keeps going for a long time. Keep up the great work. End quote. What do you think of that? Uh, that's really cool. It kind of it kind of it puts us in uh, in kind of the similar thing that like what we had in mind when we started doing this, like the friend. You know, like the friend angle, like us talking, like the way people do around dinner conversations yeah. or whatever. With it's like the same thing. Uh, that's exactly what we were going for. I'm glad that he totally got that. That's cool. That's a you know what? That's a great point. You're right. You're right. Perfect. I guess we're doing our job, Oscar. Uh, yeah. Finally. I mean. <laughs> finally. Yeah. So yeah. thank you, Taps. Good job, Oscar. Let's. Take a break and hear from our sponsors. Um, okay. Listeners, welcome back to the show. Well, the lights are turned down low. The ceremonial candle is lit. And the drinks are flowing. Let's start this show. Okay, so tonight's episode is a continuation of our ongoing serial killer spider web series. An ongoing series about a web, which I believe connects some of modern day's most evil, vile killers and serial killers, a web that spanned coast to coast, nurturing and pumping out some of the worst individuals imaginable, individuals with nothing but death and destruction on their minds. Now, tonight's evil bastard isn't as well known as, say, Charles Manson or David Berkowitz or the Zodiac. He doesn't even have a Wikipedia entry. But that doesn't huh. mean his crimes aren't just as awful as some of the heavy hitters we've covered in past episodes. 
because they are, probably even more so in some ways. Our subject doesn't have a high body count like, say, Dean Coral or John Gacy, but what he lacks in numbers, he more than makes up for in connections to our serial killer web. Now, as the episode title indicates, tonight we're talking about the hippie cannibal. Oscar, is that an oxymoron, hippie cannibal? I don't know. Well, I mean, I don't think so. It feels like it should be, but ultimately right? they're not like hippiness. I mean, I guess a lot of people to associate hippiness with vegans. So maybe that's why right. it sounds like a it, oxymoron, right? Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. But the hippie cannibal is a man named Stanley Dean Baker. Now, Stanley Dean Baker is only responsible for killing one, possibly two people in 1970 in what can only be described as a shocking display of raw brutality and desecration, all in the name of, wait for it, Satan. And it's what Baker said to police after he was caught. And believe me, this guy sang like a canary. His confession to police is what made me want to, to include him in our ongoing series. Because if what Baker said to police is true, then he's yet another deranged killer operating under the direction of an organization bent on bringing murder and chaos into the world. Why can't anyone, like, murder in the name of Windex or something? <laughs> like, when, it, when, when will that happen? Because... Like, it seems like it's 95% Satan, and the rest are, like, non-denominational religions or whatever. And like, You're right. You're no right. one's like, I'm going to kill you for Oscar Mayer Wiener. You know, <laughs> no one's – I don't understand. No. That's an astute observation, Oscar. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to mention something here. I said he's only responsible for killing one, possibly two. I didn't say that to – uh, you know, knock the victim uh, or, or possibly two victims that Baker did uh, kill and yeah. possibly killed. That's not the way I meant it. It's just that he's he's not technically a serial killer, right? Yes. A serial killer it's has to four, kill four or more, three, three mm -hmm. or more. Okay. For the sake of some psychological, some strange psychological pleasure, like sexual pleasure, mm -hmm. um, and have a cooling off period in between his kills. Right. So because... three or more. I think uh, yes, if, if there's no cooling period, I think it'll be like a spree killer, right? Exactly. Right. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. So he, he's not technically a serial killer. But that doesn't mean what he did wasn't extremely fucked up. And that doesn't mean that he doesn't tie into our, our overall web. Okay. So I just wanted to make that point. So, like I said, the Stanley Dean Baker guy. There isn't much information about him outside of the crimes he committed. He was from Sheridan, Wyoming, and apparently in 1964, he suffered a 7,200-volt electrocution from a power line during an auto accident. Wow. Car he was, yeah, the car he was driving rammed the pole, line came down, and he got electrocuted. And as a result of the massive jolt, Baker claimed that he died for a few minutes but was resurrected. And when he came back, he wasn't quite sure if it was God that, resurre that resurrected him or the devil. Hmm. The electrocution and resulting existential crisis caused Baker a bit of mental instability. And soon after the accident, he ro relocated to California and spent a lot of times on the streets of L.A., Berkeley, and San Francisco and got into heavy drugs namely Angel Dust and LSD. What is Angel Dust? Those, Sorry. What is exactly Angel Dust? That's, some... uh, that's PCP. Angel Dust is PCP. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, listeners should perk up when I say that in 19, you know, it, around this time, uh, uh, pre-1970, late 60s, this Baker guy was hanging out in L.A., Berkeley, and San Francisco. We've definitely talked about those locations uh, in other episodes that have to do with our serial killer web. Oh, yeah. So he's right in the thick of bullshit, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. 
But, you know, other than those little details, Baker was one of these random drifters common in the 60s and early 70s, just a drugged out wastoid wandering around and hitchhiking without anywhere in particular to go. And no one really cared about these drifters, certainly didn't keep records on them, and the drifters rarely made enough of an impact where they were or where they wound up for anyone to really take notice of them in any meaningful way. So again, not a lot on this guy. I couldn't find any reference to his early life or his parents to see if Baker had any of these boxes checked, which would foreshadow his crimes. Things like childhood physical or sexual abuse, head injuries, right. well, propensity. To- electrocution seems to be a huge component. Um, that is, that's, <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. That's... <laughs> But uh, I would say, though, this Point reminds taken. me of uh, how you know how people talk about unsung heroes, right? The everyday man who who do things for people that saves them for one reason or another every day that no one talks about, no one's there to see. This is like an unsung villain then, right? It's like the opposite. Yeah, that's, right? You're right. yeah I like that. A the unsung bit. villain. Right. Yeah, because without background on his family life and parents outside of that electrocution, we don't know if he was abused physically or sexually, if he actually suffered right. uh, head injuries, head trauma, if he hurt animals or pissed the bed, stuff like that. Can't find any of that info on this guy. It's like Stanley Dean Baker came out of nowhere like a whirlwind, committed his horrible crimes, confessed, and that was it. It's so strange. So on that point, let's let's get into Baker's crimes. Now, the first murder possibly committed by Stanley Dean Baker happened in April of 1970 in San Francisco, California. And and I'll explain why I said possibly committed in a little bit. Now, keep in mind, remember, less than a year earlier, just about eight months earlier, actually, the summer of love came crashing to a monstrous end with the Manson family murders. So the country at this point, is still reeling from the brutal, cult-like slayings of actress Sharon Tate and her unborn child and her friends, Abigail Folger, Jay Sebring, Wojciech Frykowski, and Stephen Parent. Go back to our Charles Manson series of releases for more information on that crime. America, especially California at this time, is in the grip of cult fever. Satan worshippers are out there and they're going to get you, was the general feeling. If the rich and famous were vulnerable, example Sharon Tate and crew, then what does that say about the average citizens? Also keep in mind, the Zodiac Killer was active at this time as well. Picking off average citizens and taunting authorities with the Zodiac letters and ciphers all throughout the 60s and 70s. People were scared. So on April 19th, 1970, when the body of famous lighting designer Robert Salem was found in his San Francisco apartment, which doubled as his workplace, and the words Satan saves and Zodiac were found written on a wall in the victim's blood, people panicked. They freaked out, thinking that the infamous Zodiac killer had switched up his M.O. and decided to start getting up close and personal with his victims, hands-on, if you will, as a knife is way more intimate a weapon than a gun. You see, autopsy reports said that Salem was likely murdered about five days earlier, on or around April 15, 1970. He had been viciously stabbed with a long-bladed knife, once in the chest and six times in the back. And the killer tried to decapitate Salem, as his head was found to be just barely attached to the torso. The killer also cut off one of Salem's ears, and the ear was never recovered. The killer took it, or did something else with it, as we'll see here in a bit. Now, as I mentioned, the words Satan saves and Zodiac were written next to each other on a wall in the victim's blood, seeming to imply that Satan saved the Zodiac. 
Also scrawled in blood was a strange symbol, a symbol that looked either like a crucified man, a thin body with the head tilted and arms outstretched, or an Egyptian ankh. This symbol, whatever it was intended to be, was also drawn on Salem's stomach, again in his own blood. Now I'll leave a link to a crime scene photo in this episode's show notes, which shows the strange writings on the wall, along with the symbol. Now, authorities pretty much from the get-go decided this was not a real Zodiac murder. Rather, just some psycho trying to throw investigators off their scent. Later, Stanley Dean Baker did confess to the murder of Robert Salem, claiming that the murder was part of a satanic ritual. But interestingly, Baker was never charged with Salem's murder. Apparently, there wasn't enough evidence to convict him. And later on, when Stanley Baker was on trial, during, during his examination on the stand, whenever he was questioned about Robert Salem, if he knew him, details about the murder, the sneaky little shit Baker pled the fifth, only saying, quote, I respectfully refuse to answer on the grounds it might tend to incriminate me, end quote. So technically, to this day, Robert Salem's murder is considered unsolved even though Baker strongly claimed credit. Now, the murder we do know Stanley Baker committed is that of a 22-year-old man from Roundup, Montana, named James Schlosser. Now, James Schlosser, by all accounts, was a good dude. College grad, worked as a social worker, enjoyed the outdoors, he was kind, respectable, Drove a cool little sports car called an Opal Cadet. Listeners, look up Opal Cadet if, Cadet if you're into cars. It's really cool. Wow. Schlosser was really the kind, kind of the epitome of, quote unquote, the other. In other words, Schlosser kind of represented the, the swath of society that hippies viewed as square or even as the type of people ruining the country. And a lot of articles I read about James Schlosser described him as big and doughy, standing six feet tall and over 200 pounds. So here's this big, doughy, kind, successful guy, and he finds himself going fishing on the Yellowstone River in Montana on July 10th, 1970. While driving down the highway in his yellow 1969 Opal Cadet with black racing stripes, Heading to his favorite fishing spot, James Schlosser notices two hippie-looking dudes, which are Stanley Dean Baker and his friend, or or more like acquaintance, Harry Allen Stroop, hitchhiking down the highway. Now, for whatever reasons, and and listeners, if, if you learned anything from this podcast over the years, for the love of God, don't pick up hitchhikers. It never ends well. Just keep driving. Apparently, did it? People used to do it like every day, right? Like it used to be much <laughs> this more. This was a means of transportation. Yeah, it was very commonplace, like use of strangers, like like the bus, more reliable than the bus is like just hitchhiking. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Strange time. Don't do it. Just keep driving. Yeah. My public service announcement is over now. Yes. Okay. Now, for whatever reason, James Schlosser pulls over and offers the two men a ride. This act of kindness would prove to be fatal for Schlosser. Now, Baker and and his acquaintance, Stroop, had been vagabonding together since approximately June 5th of that year, so they kind of knew each other. They met on a college campus in Wyoming, where, according to Baker, he was recruited by a satanic cult. Baker and Stroop then tripped up to Canada to attend a music festival then hitched their way back down to California, where they did a lot of heavy drugs and apparently met some interesting people. And ultimately, the two made their way to Montana, where James Schlosser is about to pick them up off the side of the road Hmm. on his way to go fishing, a move that will result in Schlosser's gruesome death. Yeah. Now, here's where it gets a little weird, a little unclear. According to both... Stanley Dean Baker and Harry Stroop, only Baker accepts the ride with Schlosser. 
for whatever reason, Stroop doesn't get in the car. He chooses instead to go off on his own. And it's only Stanley Dean Baker that's that rides with Schlosser to the fishing spot on the Yellowstone River. Oh. It isn't until yeah, it isn't until after the murder that Baker and Stroop meet up once again. Both men were very clear on this point. But as we'll see later, this doesn't matter to the jury. So, Stanley Dean Baker and his soon-to-be victim, James Schlosser, spend the day fishing on the Yellowstone River without incident. Later that night, when Baker and Schlosser make camp on the bank of the Yellowstone, a terrible storm rips through the area, and there's a ton of lightning. It's during this storm that Baker loses his fucking mind, probably on, and Baker admits he was on, massive doses of LSD approximately 60-something 60, 60 hits of LSD, according to Baker. In a blind, I don't know, rage, LSD-induced hallucination, Baker walks over to an innocently sleeping Schlosser and shoots him twice in the head with a twenty two pistol Baker always carried with himself, hmm. killing Schlosser instantly. Baker then stabbed the poor guy 27 times with a five-inch bladed knife. Baker then removed Schlosser's head, arms, and legs, likely using the same five-inch knife, as later investigators described the decapitation and limb removal as crude. Baker didn't use a surgical instrument. He probably used this five-inch buck knife. Now, I could just imagine this sick fucker maniacally hacking and sawing away at Schossler's body with with less than an ideal instrument, a five-inch knife. Baker's covered in blood, slick with sweat from the task at hand and the massive amounts of LSD in his system. Pupils dilated to black saucers, lightning crashing overhead. It really is a horror movie. Now, if what Baker's done up to this point isn't bad enough, Here's where it gets really nasty. Before dumping Schossler's torso into the Yellowstone River, Stanley Dean Baker opened up his chest with the same crude knife, drove his filthy hands deep into the bloody cavity, took hold of Schlosser's heart, tore it free, and ate it. Raw. Cannibalism, folks. It kinda... Baker then dumped... Yes. Oh, sorry. It kind of reminds me of that um, that scene when Daenerys has to eat the host, the horse heart raw in front of everyone when she's pregnant. In Game oh, of in Game of Thrones. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of yeah. That. Um, That's like sickening. That, that scene come to life, right? Cannibalism. So after eating Schlosser's heart raw, Baker dumps the headless, limbless, heartless body into the Yellowstone River and it was discovered a day later by another fisherman. And so you know, try as they might, the cops never recovered Schlosser's head, arms, or legs. Now, just a quick pause here, because I want to go back to the Robert Salem murder we talked about just a bit ago. Right. It's believed, yeah, it's believed that Salem's missing ear made its way into Stanley Dean Baker's stomach. Just like Schlosser's heart. Oh. Yes. After all, the ear was never recovered. It's definitely small enough to eat. And Baker did claim responsibility for Salem's murder. Ipso facto, Baker ate the ear. Gross, right? Yeah. Also, funny sentence. Baker ate the ear. <laughs> it sounds like a funny <laughs> sentence. That's all I'm saying. Sorry. That could be in a children's book. Right, basically. <laughs> So anyway, after murdering and cannibalizing Schlosser, Baker stole Schlosser's car and got the hell out of Dodge. On his way out of town, according to Baker and Harry Stroop's story, Baker runs into Stroop hitchhiking on the side of the road. Convenient, right? Baker picks up Stroop and the two head out of Montana and back into California. On July 13th, 1970, while driving down a dirt road in the Santa Cruz Mountains in Monterey County, California, Baker and Stroop are involved in a car accident. 
they were driving Schuller's stolen car, Schossler's stolen car recklessly on the wrong side of the dirt road when they collided with the truck driven by a businessman from Detroit in California on vacation. No one was really injured, but when the man from the De- from Detroit drove Baker and Stroop to a payphone so the police could be called, the two men took off running and disappeared into some nearby woods, some some woods close to the area. The authorities were immediately contacted, and a very short time later, both Baker and Stroop were apprehended, as they were, yet again, walking down the side of a highway. These These aren't criminal mastermind folks, okay? Now, almost immediately, Stanley Dean Baker confessed to Schlosser's murder, telling the cops chillingly that, quote, I have a problem. I'm a cannibal, end quote. And when Baker was searched, police found in his pockets two items that looked eerily similar to, to grisly chicken bones. And I'm sure you could guess that these items in, in Baker's pockets weren't chicken bones at all. They were, in fact, a few of Jane Schlosser's severed fingers. Baker had kept the fingers so he could, in his own words, gnaw on them later. And from the looks of the fingers, it appeared as though he had been gnawing on them already. Now, articles differ on this next point, but, according to some sources, Harry Stroop also had one of Schlosser's fingers in his pocket. Although I myself don't believe this because this little detail was never brought up as evidence in court. Anyway, Stanley Dean Baker was also found to have a recipe for LSD on his person, as well as a copy of Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible. The twenty two Baker used to shoot Schlosser was apparently tossed into the Yellowstone River along with Schlosser's torso, and it was never recovered. And the five-inch knife Baker used to murder and dismember Schlosser, that was later found by authorities back at the murder scene. Now, ultimately, Stanley Dean Baker claimed that he committed Schlosser's horrific murder all by himself. He was adamant that Harry Stroop was not there, and he had nothing to do with it. So at the end of the day, Stanley Dean Baker was convicted of murdering James Schlosser and given a life sentence plus 10 days for cursing at the judge during his trial. Now, during his trial, Baker said all sorts of crazy, crazy shit. He referred to himself as Jesus. He said that through his own mental strength and mental powers, he could control the weather. And according to Baker, it was his superior, his superior mental powers that allowed him to kill none other than Jimi Hendrix, all the way over in London on September 18th, 1970. Yeah, he claimed to have killed Jimi Hendrix. Jesus, well, yeah, Obvious. Yeah. If you have one first-degree murder, just go nuts, right? Yeah, let's just see what sticks. Now, obviously, this was a deeply disturbed man, and behind bars for life is definitely where he belonged. Now, Harry Stroop, on the other hand, was convicted of manslaughter, even though both Baker and Stroop claimed he wasn't involved. Because, the jury decided, Baker himself couldn't have butchered the much physically larger Schlosser and then dumped his torso into the Yellowstone River all by himself. That, and a Yellowstone Park ranger testified that he witnessed three individuals in Schlosser's car hours before the murder. That would have most likely been James Schlosser, the driver, Stanley Dean Baker, a passenger, and Harry Stroop, the third person in the car. With only those two pieces of circumstantial evidence and no physical evidence of his involvement in the murder, Harry Stroop was given a 10-year sentence, again, for manslaughter, and he was out of jail in two years. Now, Harry Stroop continued to get into trouble over the years, mostly for drugs and drug-related crimes, And he continued to find himself in and out of prison, just a low life through and through. And Harry Stroop died in 2018 of natural causes. Now, here's the kicker. As for Stanley Dean Baker, as it turns out, 
in Montana, where Baker was sentenced to life in prison, back in the 70s, criminals given a life sentence in in Montana could apply for parole 12 years into their prison sentence. And that's exactly what Stanley Dean Baker did. At the 12-year mark, Baker began applying for parole. And after serving only 16 years, during which time he was viewed as a model prisoner, Stanley Dean Baker was actually granted parole. He served only 16 years for the murder, for the murder and cannibalization of James Schlosser. Can you fucking believe it? 16 oh, years for butchering and eating someone. Just unbelievable. That's crazy, yeah. What a loophole. What a strange loophole. Right? Fuck the law, man. After his parole, Baker disappeared for a long time, but he was later found by investigators working for the old television show called A Current Affair, a lurid infotainment show hosted by Maury Povich. A Current Affair investigators located Stanley Dean Baker in Minnesota, where he was found to be a top salesman at a sporting goods store. Good for you, Baker. Make that money. Now, after the airing of the A Current Affair episode featuring Stanley Dean Baker, Baker was promptly fired from his job. Can't have a butcher selling knives, I guess. I don't know. And next to nothing is known about Baker after that until he reportedly died of liver cancer in Minnesota in 1994. So, So they're both gone. And that's the end. Case closed for Stanley Dean Baker, Harry Allen Stroop, and poor James Schlosser. Ah, case closed for them, but not for our ongoing spider web of killers. Here's where it gets really interesting. Upon his arrest for killing James Schlosser, remember when Baker said, I have a problem, I'm a cannibal? That's not the only strange thing Baker said to cops. No, no, no. Baker also told police that he was responsible for other satanic ritual murders and human sacrifices in the Santa Ana Mountains in California, south of Los Angeles. Baker told police that he was part of a shadowy satanic murder group headquartered in the Santa Cruz Mountains in California known as the Four Pi. That's four, F-O-U-R, and Pi, P-I, Four Pi also known as the Four Pi Movement. Now, we've talked about Four Pi on the podcast before. Baker claimed that murders and sacrifices he committed were committed under the direction of a real bad motherfucker known only as the Grand Chingon, or the Head Devil, including the the murder of Robert Salem. In fact, it's believed that Baker and Stroop were on their way to see the Grand Chingon when they were involved in that auto accident in California. The one with the, with the vacationer from Detroit, the incident that spelled the end for Baker and Stroop's murderous odyssey. Remember, that, ac- that accident took place on a dirt road in the Santa Cruz Mountains, where supposedly the headquarters for the Four Pi were located. Yeah, um, that's insane. And also, you yes. know what Chingon is, right? Yeah, well, it's kind of like badass or, or asshole. You know, it's kind of, right? It's, it's yeah. more like a badass or like a tough guy. or Yeah, so Chingon, yeah, it's like a tough guy, like a, like a bad motherfucker, basically. Right. Like that. And the way that the title suggests, that's what it means. And, that's what uh, it means, okay. Meaning that this is Spanish, so we're talking about like a Hispanic guy? I don't believe so. Huh. I really don't, and, and I'll get into this here. Oh, okay. Uh, so, no, 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 no. It's a great. I, I get it, but I don't. I don't believe so. Huh. Um, so this this Grand Chingon, or or his other name was the Head Devil. I do believe this is the first time we've mentioned this mysterious puppet master on the podcast. But in doing overall research into my spiderweb theory, this person comes up again and again. No one knows who the Grand Chingon was or is because, in theory, he could still be alive today. Right. He'd be old as hell, but it's not inconceivable that he could still be out there somewhere. 
Now, I have my theories as to who the Grand Chingon is, but I'm not ready to release that information yet. But I can say this. The Grand Chingon is described as being an older white male, very affluent, quite powerful, Hmm. powerful either politically, economically, or cultally. Is that a word? I don't know. What I mean is that he was possibly at the top of some murderous cult, maybe the Four Pie, and he lived in California. That's it. That's all we really know about this guy. Well, they all live in but, California. They all like went there to kill. It's like California kill. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But uh, the 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 what did I say the Santa Monica Mountains isn't that what I said Santa, uh, Santa Monica Mountains. Yes, I think so. Uh, that's a hint there. I mean that because this four pie was also located in the Santa Monica Mountains. So right. I don't know, but it's this rich, powerful white guy from California. That is supposedly behind much of this roving group of assassins, these killers acting nationwide. He's believed to be behind a lot of their devilish activity. For what purposes? No one really knows. But I bet my life this guy's goal was to bring chaos, destruction, and death into the world by any means possible. And whether the Grand Chingon viewed his, viewed his actions, his manipulations as evil, I think, is open for debate. Maybe the Grand Chingon was just trying to be the best version of himself he could be. We see it as evil, sure. But if this guy was, say, sorted into the wrong house, hint, hint, Slytherin Mm. instead of Gryffindor, he'd be encouraged to do all he can to project his personal traits and beliefs onto the world. That was all hints, listeners, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Or <laughs> or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the Grand Chingon wasn't part of a freaky cult. But instead, maybe he was part of something much bigger, something state-sponsored. Now, I know all this sounds crazy, and, and we're going to have to wait for future episodes of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies podcast to find out more about that. Just in case you're finding all this a little unbelievable, this Grand Chingon, the head devil thing, there's one more reference to him before we close this episode. On June 3rd, 1970, a guy by the name of Stephen Craig Hurd, a self-proclaimed devil worshiper, and his small band of Satanists forced their way into Florence Nancy Brown's car as she exited the I-5 freeway in California. Brown, 31 years old and a mother of five, was forced to drive to an orange grove in Irvine, California, where Stephen Hurd stabbed her over 20 times, cut off her arm, then stuffed Brown's body into her own car and drove it to El Carrizo and buried her in a shallow grave off the Ortega Highway. Hurd then returned to the scene a few days later. He dug up Brown's remains. He opened up her chest, and just like our friend Stanley Dean Baker, Heard ate her rotting heart. He said it tasted like chicken. Now, Stephen Heard confessed that he was going to use Brown's car to drive himself and his band of merry little Satanists to San Francisco, mm-hmm. where he was planning to meet with, are you ready, the head devil. Maybe we'll cover Hurd and his crew in another episode, but ultimately, so you know, Stephen Hurd died of a brain hemorrhage on May 28th, 2005. <sighs> so there you have it. Yet another strand in our serial killer web. The web is getting bigger, and we still have more to cover. Listeners, stay tuned. Oscar, what the hell do you think of all this? Well, is there a point in... Uh, doing a show on her now that we know what he did just now or did he do more uh there were a couple other murders you know it's he's kind of a throwaway killer to be honest i i used him to emphasize my point yeah. that multiple people were on their way to see the grand chingon or the head devil right you know yeah, so yeah. no we don't have we don't necessarily have to listeners could it's steven hurd h-u-r-d yeah uh, yeah, not like I heard that. 
Yeah. Um, Correct. Or herd of cattle. Uh, yeah, it's Correct. um, it's this. Yeah, it's funny how this uh, one murderer do that. The the heart thing makes it seem like it's um ah the minute it's like you know when you think of Charles Manson and how he used uh, drugs, LSD primarily, of course, to like psychologically fuel their his 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 cult to do these acts that he wanted Absolutely. them to do. Absolutely. Like it's almost like there's like a there's some sort of like manual within this organization, this web if you if you will, in San Francisco or whatever. This manual that says like, okay, so when you first give them the dosage, if you want them to A cut the heart out, B eat the heart, or C piss <laughs> on the heart, you have to tell them this. And like it seems like a like some sort of guidebook because this other guy's doing it too uh, even if it's like a few days later, um, that's a great point, man. Yeah. It's really weird. And and I'll tell you, uh, you're you're touching on something that's you don't even know it. That's part uh, of another episode that has to fit into the spider web. Um, I don't. Uh, I guess no. It's um, okay. Don't mention. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna mention. I'm gonna hold it. But uh, you're onto something there. Ooh, with nice. LSD handbook. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, out, standard operating procedure. Right. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah, oh God, I'm biting it, my tongue. It feels like it feels like that. Um, it's starting to feel that great, way anyway. You know, it's, great picking up on that. You're absolutely right. Because there's been other examples where you know stuff is happening, and it all seems like a drug fueled frenzy, but also like not really. Um, you know, like it could be both ways. It could be manipulated insanity. You know. Like trying to control a hurricane. Manipulated insanity. Oh God. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Okay. Yes. No. Yeah. Agree a hundred percent. And um, and, I, and one thing I like about this episode, uh, even though we've covered a lot of murderers here and different different spectrums of them, uh, I would say that this one feels like we're actually closer to the center of the web more than more than mm. some of the last ones. This feels that mm. way to me. Okay. I don't I don't know why exactly, but I think this head chingon guy is is part of that reason, maybe. Uh, and every time you mention like, oh yeah, this guy who was born in somewhere that is in California totally goes to California. Uh, yes, that happens a lot too. So yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's like they get a calling. It's like an astro. Like they see the they see the star signs differently than we do, or something. It just has an arrow. Yeah, it's in like California. the. It's like the fucked up star of Bethlehem or something. Right, yeah. The, the, the anti star of Bethlehem. The South Star, not the North Star. Right. <laughs> yeah, oh, good, yes. To reference back to 2012 episodes, right. North Star. Basically. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Yeah, that's that's why I think it's pretty cool. I mean, it's fucked up, but cool. Yeah. Cool no, story. I got you. Yeah. So you, you like? Yeah, definitely. It was really cool. Awesome. Any uh, final thoughts? Oh no! I said it already. It's that's. I, I mean, as far as the uh, the LSD stuff goes, that's that was the main takeaway I got from this thing. Uh, the guy seems to be like, I don't know, pretty atypical. Uh, not, you know, now that I've heard, now that you've done twenty of these serial killers, you know, they kind of start. <laughs> you kind of start packaging them in certain like columns, right, of reactions. Yeah. Uh, it's funny how you just start confessing so fast and over confessing. Why do they do that? They can, can't you just confess to what you know for sure? Or d does he really think that he killed Jimi Hendrix? Like I don't, oh, I know, right? I don't understand. People are so yeah, weird. No, he was nuts. He was nuts, dude. Yeah. He was nuts. Yeah. But sixteen years he got for all this. Yeah, yeah. That's just shocking. It's it's unbelievable. And then he goes working at a Dick Sporting Goods after. <laughs> well, I didn't say dicks. Dicks don't sue us. No, well, they can't, uh, was... but uh, I was just saying as an example, but, or. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He just, he it's just crazy. went and, and lived life normally. Didn't get into any other trouble as far as uh, anyone has reported anything I found in my research. Yeah. He just tried to live and then <laughs> a current affair fucked it all up for him. Yeah, I know. Super weird. Uh, well. Crazy. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I hope we dropped a lot of uh, little interesting breadcrumbs for the listeners to, to keep them listening for the next serial killer episode or, or, or web episode, I should say. Yeah. I think there was a lot of little clues in here, a lot of little fun things to pick up on and run with. Definitely. Uh, so hope they liked it. Yeah. 
All right. Well, if that is it, Mr. Oscar Specter, please carefully in this snow and driving ice, take us home. Will do.